Welcome to another tutorial from Burton's Media Group. I'm Dr. Brian Burton and I'll be leading you through this series of tutorials on how to build a basic star or asteroids-esque game. This is going to be an eight-part series to build a basic game. You can find the full written instructions on the Corona website at the address supplied below and I'll also include the address in the notes. To get started with your Corona application, you will need some type of a editor such as Sublime or Text Wrangler or Notepad or any of those tools. Whatever you're, you like to do your editing in will work fine for working with Lua as well. We're going to start this example by launching the Corona Simulator and you can click on New Project, give the name of your project. We're going to preset this for tablet, which automatically changes the width and height settings for within the application. We're going to use a blank template. As you can see, there's several other templates that are of use for creating your application as well, including tabbed, gamed, creating an ebook, or using composer scenes. Our orientation within this game will be upright or portrait, and we just simply click next and tell it where you want to save your application. I've already created a folder on my desktop called Star Explorer where I can just simply click create and it creates the entire thing. Then we will open the folder and I'm going to open the folder with Sublime Editor. The Corona Simulator automatically creates a number of files for you including your build settings information, your Corona Dot Lua file, all the basic icons. Now these are not ready to publish obviously, but they do give you the correct sizes that will be needed by the various app stores. And our main.lua file, which is primarily blank. This is where we'll start our programming for the application. I copied into the folder for my Star Explorer a group of assets, including a background that'll be used. Um, this is an 800 by 1400 pixel PNG file that will serve as our background and a sprite sheet has also been created for this application which will be loading into the app to handle the entire gameplay. So let's start by looking at our build.settings. Build.settings provides information to the Corona SDK for the build time or creating the application. This tells what the orientation of the device is going to be the associated icon files that will be passed to the various stores when you're ready to publish, as well as a few other settings including does the application use the internet, is it going to be serving or loading ads, important things like that. And we'll talk more about the build settings later when we start adding ads to our application. We also have the config.lewis information. It is useful to the Corona system for specifying what the default width and height in pixels is going to be set at. This allows us to more easily generate applications so that we don't have to worry about creating graphics and sizes for every single different change that's out there. So we're going for a default width and height of 768 by 1024. We're going to use scaling inside this application. Corona will automatically scale the app so that, and there's various different types of scaling that's available, but it will scale the app so that it looks good on all the different types of devices. There are two default or preferred types of scaling used inside the Corona SDK. One is Letterbox. Letterbox limits the content area to the screen area, but that may cause some of the area to be left black or um, opaque, so that it's so that every all the graphics and images are sized and visible on the screen. The second most commonly used is zoom even. The problem with zoom even though is that it may go outside the boundaries of your screen size to get all of the graphics onto the system evenly. So the preferred is usually letterbox for most applications, but play around with the different scaling options and see what works best for you. The final part that we're going to look at in our config.lua is the frames per second. This is how frequently the screen is going to be updated. The recommended setting for most apps and all games is 60 frames per second. So we'll save that and let's get started on the main.lua file. First thing we need to do in main.lua is get our physics 
started. Physics inside of Corona SDK uses the Box 2D physics, and in just a couple of lines of code, you're able to load the entire physics engine into Corona and utilize it within your app. That'll give you collisions, it'll give you the ability to add gravity to your game, all kinds of great physics functions that makes the game and the environment much more easier and much easier for you as a game developer. We'll start by creating a variable to store our physics in so that we can more easily reference it as we develop our application. So I've assigned the physics or Box2D engine, which is loaded externally, it's a plugin. I've assigned it to the variable physics. Remember that variables, local variables in the Lua scripting language are assigned using the local keyword. Then we'll start our physics engine. And since this game is set in outer space, we really don't need gravity, so let's turn that off. Now, with our set gravity, we are able to control the direction of gravity. A negative amount on the first character, which controls the horizontal movement. Negative amount will move an object to the left. A positive amount will move it to the right. Zero, obviously, uh, has no gravity associated with it. Y, the second one is the Y, or the uh, vertical. So negative amount would move an object towards the top. A positive amount will move your object down or to, towards the bottom of your screen. Generally, we set it at 9.8 if we want to simulate Earth's gravity and pull the object towards the bottom. So if we wanted a game that had simulated Earth's gravity, we would put 9.8 in the Y parameter of our physics gravity. This game is going to have a random element to it. As is frequently discussed in generation of random numbers on computers, they're not truly random, um, but to give it more of a random appearance, we can randomize the seed so that it's not exactly the same every time the game starts up. So let's go ahead and do that. Using the math library, I am randomizing the random number generator based upon the current time. So every time someone plays this, it will start with a different series of random numbers. The next thing that we need to do is start getting our graphics into the game. First of all, we will load a, our sprite sheet. Now sprite sheets can be generated in a number of ways. We're going to hand code the layout for the sprite sheet that's associated with this. You can more easily generate your sprite sheet with a tool such as Texture Packer. That uh, works great. It generates the parameters for all the objects that are stored in there and compresses the graphics into as small as area as possible. For simplicity and to, well, not really simplicity, but to more accurately show how sprite sheets are configured and loaded into a program like the Corona SDK, we're going to go ahead and put that in by hand. And I'm just going to type this in real quick and then we'll we'll come back and discuss what's there. Okay, we've got that entered now. We've got local sheet options that describes the location, width, and height of every object that's stored in our sprite sheet. Now again, remember, sprite sheets are very useful for being able to get all of our graphics loaded at once, dramatically reducing the amount of memory that's used inside the application. So I have three asteroids, a ship, and a laser associated with this application. Again, let's look at our game objects. Asteroid 1, 2, 3, our spaceship, and our missile that will be fired. So here's Asteroid 1. It starts at a location of X0, Y0. That's the top left-hand corner of the asteroid. And then it has a width of 102 pixels and a height of 85 pixels. So starting at 0, 0, and going to the bottom right hand corner that fully describes the location and the size of the asteroid object. And then we have the exact same information for each of the asteroids, the ship, as well as the laser that will be fired. So now that we have described the sprite sheet, we're now able to load that into memory. Again, you can use a tool such as Texture Packer that will automatically generate this description of the sprite sheet and make it much easier so that you don't have to go through and do that by hand. You can just simply load it into memory and then access it and use it inside your application. 
So let's load our sheet, our sprite sheet, and we'll store that in object sheet. And after we have our object sheet in there, so local object sheet equals graphics dot new image sheet. Tell it where you're loading it from. This is the folder assets and the name of the sprite sheet game objects and then our options variable that describes the sprite sheet so that it can be loaded properly. That passes everything in. Now we can of course save at this point and check to make sure everything is working as it should and apparently it's not. It looks like I messed up gravity so let's take a look on line 10 so let's take a look at that yes I did I messed that up that should be set gravity there we go you can save that make sure we don't get any errors and good um, you can also turn on the console and let's initialize some variables so that they are set for the game environment I'm going to put those in real quick and we'll explain all of those Okay, here's my variables that'll get our game started. We've got a variable to keep track of the number of lives of the player, their current score, have they died. Um, you'll find that very useful later on. We need to keep track of whether or not the ship has been destroyed or not to make it easier for cleaning up the scene. We also have a table for storing the number of asteroids on the scene, which will make it easier, again, to clean up the number of asteroids that are inside the game environment. Finally, we also have a variable to store the ship that will be in our game. We've got a variable for controlling the amount of time between loops and a variable to display the number of lives that are left and their this player's current score. To simplify keeping track of all the objects that are on the screen we're going to use display groups. Now display groups allow us to work with an entire set of display objects cleanly and easily so that they interact properly and, but we can use just simply one or two commands to be able to interact with all of them. For this game we're going to use three display groups one for our background, one for our main group, and one for our user interface or the text and scores that will be displayed at the top. There we go. So we got a background group, a main group, and a user interface group. And I went ahead and included the comments on each one to make it clear exactly what each one is uh, there for. Now let's go ahead and load our background image into the game and get that associated with its group. Okay, so now we got background. We load background into the variable called background. I know, completely original. And then load the graphic image using display.newImageRectangle, which will automatically resize the image for us. Uh, background is the group that it's being stored in the image which is actually in our assets and then the size of the image as it's being loaded. Image rectangle will automatically resize or look for the appropriate size for images that are going to be associated. Image New image rect automatically loads the correct size or will resize an image for the game environment if you give it its parameters. And then we'll locate the background in the center of the object. Remember when you're loading objects into the Corona SDK, by default you're loading the center of the object to the XY location. So we are placing the center of the background scene in the center of the display so it'll fully cover the entire environment. And we'll save it. Well, apparently I have an error. Yes, I did have an error. I wasn't loading assets properly. Instead of double periods, I need to use the forward slash to distinguish that this is all being loaded from the assets folder. So once I change that for my uh, objects sheet, which loads the sprite sheet and my background, everything loads as it should. So now we have our nice background scene for our environment. So let's load our ship into the environment. We've already declared ship as a variable up here in our variable declarations. Now we're going to assign it an image. It'll be stored as part of the main display group. Again, we're loading it from our object sheet, giving it which object that we're loading. It's the fourth object inside that sheet and what the size of the image is, so 98 and 79. We'll set it in the center towards the bottom, about 100 pixels up from the bottom, and then we're going to add it as a body to the game engine. 
so that it will be able to interact with other objects inside the environment. So this makes it a physics body capable of having collisions inside the game. We'll give it a radius of 30 pixels. That'll be the collision area around the ship. And then finally, we're going to give the ship a name, making it easier to do collision detection inside the environment. We'll assign it the name ship. I know, again, terribly original. It will make it easier for doing collision detection later on. If you want to see this now in the game, just simply do a save and check your Corona SDK, and there you have your ship inside the environment. We can't interact with it yet. We still got to do some more programming with, to get there, but this is the first step. So let's go ahead and get our text onto the screen, the lives and score. There we go. So we got lives. We have lives text and score text. Again, we declared these above in our variable declarations. This will add the new text of lives and the score, including whatever the current lives or score is. It is being included as part of the user interface group, display group. And we'll use the location of 200 pixels over for the lives, 80 pixels down from the top. We're going to use the native system font and set the size at 36. Of course, if you want a larger font size, you're welcome to change that. Bigger numbers, bigger fonts and the score will be at the other side of the screen. We're gonna go 400 pixels over and again, 80 pixels down. Now, if you save this, you can get a view for what it looks like inside the environment. There we go. You might want to adjust that, bring the score a little more over to the right. Uh, might be a little bit more visually pleasing to you. So let's try 600 there. Let's see if that looks a little better. Yeah, I like that a lot more. A little bit more balance there and I don't think we need the status bar at the top so let's get rid of that there we go and now the status bar is called display dot set status bar and then passing it the parameter display dot hidden status bar will hide it from view for your game playing pleasure Okay, so let's do one more thing before we end this part one, and that's going to be create a function that will allow us to update the current lives and score. Now this is a real simple function. It's just changing the text property of the lives.txt and score.txt and updating it with the new lives and score value. And this can then be called from our game loop so that it is updated 60 times per second and gives us lots of fast information and current score data. Okay, so that completes our part one. In part two, we're going to be looking at chapter three from the Corona Guide, and in there we are going to load our asteroids, add firing to our game, be able to move our ship, set up the, game, the ability to move our ship around inside the game environment, and handle any collisions that might occur inside of our game. So it's going to be a big chapter, but we'll be able to progress quickly with our game. We have a lot more tutorials and lessons forthcoming. If you'd like to follow what's happening, you can follow us on Twitter at Dr. Brian Burton or Facebook at Burton's Media Group, or follow us on our website, burtonsmediagroup.com. If you'd like notification through YouTube, hit the like or subscribe button. 